Now I tell you for the hundredth time, you will never marry my niece. And I tell you for the thousandth time, that I will marry your niece. And right soon, too. Never! Your niece is of age, Mr. Vandergelder. Your niece has consented to marry me. This is a free country, Mr. Vandergelder, not a private kingdom of your own. There are no free countries for fools, Mr. Kemper. Thank you for the honor of your visit. Good morning. Mr. Vandergelder, will you please sit still for a minute? If I cut your throat, it'll be practically unintentional. Armengard is not for you, nor for anyone who can't support her. I tell you, I can support her. I make a very good living. No, sir. A living is made, Mr. Kemper, by selling something that somebody needs every at least once a year. Yes, but... Yes, sir. And a million is made by producing something that somebody needs every day. You artists produce something that nobody needs at any time. That's not true. You may sell a picture every once in a while, but you'll make no living. <sighs> Joe, go over there now three times. I want to talk to Cornelius. Not only can I support her now, but I have considerable expectations. Expectations? We merchants don't do business with them. I don't keep accounts with people who promise to somehow make something someday, and I certainly don't allow my niece to marry such people. Very well. From now on, you might as well know that I regard any way for us to get married as right and fair. Ermengarde is of age, and there is no law. Law? Let me tell you something. Mr. Kemper, most of the people in the world are fools. The law is there to prevent crime. We men of sense are there to prevent foolishness. It is I, and not the law, that will prevent Ermengarde from marrying you. I've taken some steps already. I've sent her away to get this nonsense out of her head. Ermengarde's not here. She's gone. East, west, north, south. I thank you for the honor of your visit. Everything's ready, Mr. Vandergelder. Ermengarde and I have just finished packing the trunk. Hold your tongue. Yes, Mr. Vandergelder. Ermengarde is ready to leave. Her trunk's all marked. Care, Miss Van Heusen, 8 Jackson Street, New York. Death the damnation! Did I tell you it was a secret? Care, Miss Van Heusen, 8 Jackson Street, New York. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Vandergelder. It won't help you, Mr. Kemper. Deaf and blind, at least you could do me the favor of being dumb. Such a temper! Lord save us! Yes, Mr. Vandergelder? Go and get my niece's trunk and carry it over to the station. Wait! Gertrude, has Mrs. Levi arrived yet? Don't shout! I can hear perfectly well. Everything is clearly marked. Have the buggy brought round to the front of the store in half an hour. Yes, Mr. Rennigelder. This morning I'm joining my lodge parade. This afternoon I'm going to New York. Now, before I go, I want to talk to you and Barnaby again. Good news. Fact is, I'm going to promote you. Now, how old are you? Thirty-three, Mr. Vandergelder. What? Thirty-three. That all? That's a foolish age to be at. I thought you were forty. Thirty-three. A man's not worth a cent until he's forty. We just pay him wages to make mistakes, don't we, Joe? You almost lost an ear on it, Mr. Vandergelder. Now, I was thinking of promoting you to chief clerk. What am I now, Mr. Vandergelder? You're an impertinent fool, that's what you are. Now, if you behave yourself, I'll promote you from impertinent fool to chief clerk with a raise in your wages. And Barnaby may be promoted from idiot apprentice to incompetent clerk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vandergelder. However, I want to see you and Barnaby again before I go. Now, go and get my niece's trunk. Yes. Mr. Vandergelder. Joe, the world's getting crazier every minute. Like my father always used to say, the horses will be taking over the world soon. I did what I could, Mr. Vandergelder. What with you flying in and out of the chair? <laughs> if 
fine, fine joke. You do a fine job. The same fine job you've been doing me for 20 years. Joe, I've, uh, I've got special reasons for looking my best today. Isn't there something a little extra you could do? Something a little special? I'll pay you right up to 50 cents. See what I mean? Do some of those things you do to the, the young fellas. Touch me up. Smart me up a bit. All I know is 15 cents worth like usual, Mr. Vandergelder. And that includes everything that's decent to do to a man. Now hold your horses, Joe. All I meant was... Uh... I've served you for 20 years and you've never asked me no such question before. Now hold your horses, I say, Joe. I'm going to tell you a secret. But I don't want you telling it to that riffraff down at the barber, what I'm going to tell you now. Now, all I ask of you is something a little extra, because, well, I'm thinking of getting married again. And this afternoon, I plan to call my intended a very refined lady. Your getting married is none of my business, Mr. Vandergelder. I've done everything to you I know, and the charge is 15 cents like it always was, and I don't dye no hair. Even for 50 cents, I don't. Just get and get out! And lastly, it looks to me like you're pretty rash to judge which is fools and which isn't fools, Mr. Vandergelder. People who eat onions are bad judges of people who eat onions and whose ain't. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, Mr. Vandergelder. Well, what do you want? Uncle, you said you wanted to talk to us? Uh, yes, uh, Gertrude, go and get my parade regalia. The uniform for my large parade. What? Uh. Oh, yes. Lord have mercy. Ermengard, I had a talk with that artist of yours. He's a fool. <laughs> Weeping? The weeping? You can go down and weep for a while in New York where it won't be noticed. Ermengarde, I told him that when you were old enough to marry, you marry someone who could support you. I've done you a good turn. Thank me when you're 50. But Uncle, I love him. I tell you, you don't. I do. And I tell you, you don't. Leave those things to me. If I don't marry Ambrose, I know I'll die. What of? A broken heart. Never heard of it. <laughs> Mrs. Levi is coming in a moment to take you to New York. There you'll stay in two or three weeks with <laughs> Miss Van Heusen, an old friend of your mother's. You are not to receive any letters except from me. I'll come to New York this afternoon and I'll call on you tomorrow. <laughs> Who are you? Malachi Stank, Your Honor. I heard you wanted an apprentice in the hay feed provisions and hardware business. An apprentice? <laughs> At your age? I bring a lot of experience to it. Have you any letters of recommendation? Yes, indeed, Your Honor. <laughs> First class recommendation. <laughs> Ermengarde, are you ready to start? Yes. Well, go and get ready some more. And Ermengarde, let me know the minute Mrs. Levi gets here. Yes, I'll go for it. I don't want an able seaman, nor a typesetter. Well, I certainly don't want a hospital cook. No, but it's all experience, Your Honor. Excuse me. This one is from your former, your former partner, um, Joshua Van Toyle in Albany. For the most part, honest and reliable. Occasionally willing and diligent. Seems to be a certain amount of hesitation about these recommendations. <laughs> a businessman on writers, Your Honor. There's about one businessman in a thousand that can write a good letter of recommendation, Your Honor. Mr. Van Twill sends his best wishes and wants to know if you can use me in the provisions and hardware business. Not so fast, not so fast. What's this, your honor, you use so often? 
Mr. Van Toyle says you're the president of the Hudson River Provision Dealers Recreational Musical and Burial Society. I am. But there's no your honor that goes with it. Why did you come to Yonkers? I heard that you had an apprentice who was a good for nothing, and that you were at your wit's end for another. Wit's end? Wit's end? There's no dearth of good for nothing apprentices. That's right, uh, Mr. Vandegelder. It's employers there's a dearth of. <laughs> it seems you hear of a new one dying every day. <laughs> What's that? Hold your tongue. So I see here that you've been a, a barber and a valet, too. Why have you changed your place so often? <laughs> changed my place? <clears throat> uh, Mr. Vandegelder, one of man's interested in experience. Do you drink? Oh, no, thanks. I just had breakfast. I didn't ask you whether, idiot. I asked you if you were a drunkard. No, <laughs> no, why? Looking at it from all sides, I don't even like liquor. Well, if you keep looking at it from all sides, out you go. Remember that, here. Now, with all your faults, I'm going to give you a try. Thank you, Mr. Van Gelder. You'll never regret it. Now, Today, I want to use you in New York. I judge you know your way around New York? Do I know New York? Mr. Vandegelder, I know every hole and corner in New York. Here's a dollar. The train leaves in a minute. Carry that bag over to the Central Hotel on Water Street. Have them save me a room. Wait for me, and I'll be there about 4 o'clock. Yes, Mr. Vandegelder. Oh, but uh, first I'd like to see, like to meet the other clerks that I'm to work with. You haven't time. Hurry off now. The station's right across the street. Yes, sir. You'll see, sir. You'll never regret it. I regret it already. Go on. <laughs> off with you. Ninety-nine percent the people in the world are fools, and the rest of us are in great danger of contagion. But no, I wasn't always as free as foolishness as I am now. I was once young, which was foolish. I fell in love, which was foolish. And I got married, which was foolish. For a while there, I was poor, which is even more foolish than all the other things put together. Now, then my wife died, which was foolish of her. I grew older, which was sensible of me. And then I became a rich man, which is as sensible as it is rare. Now, since you see I'm a man of sense, I guess you were surprised to find that well, I've decided to get married again. Well, I have two reasons for it. In the first place, I like my house run with order, comfort, and economy. That's a woman's work. But, well, even a woman can't do it well if she's merely being paid for it. In order to run a house well, a woman must have the feeling that she owns it. Marriage is a bribe to make a housekeeper think she's a householder. Have you ever seen an ant? carry a burden twice its size. What excitement, what patience, what will. <laughs> well, that's what I think of when I see a woman running a house. What giant passions in those little bodies. What quarrels with a butcher for the best cut. What fury of discovering a moth in a cupboard. Believe me, if women could harness their natures to something bigger than a house and a baby carriage, they change the world. <laughs> and the second reason, reason, ladies and gentlemen, well, I can see by your faces that you've already guessed it. There's nothing like mixing with women to bring out all the foolishness in a man of sense. And that's a risk I'm willing to take. I've just turned 60, and I've just laid side by side the last dollar of my first half million. So if I should lose my head a little, I still have enough money to buy it back. Yes, after many years' caution and hard work, I think I've earned the right to a little risk and adventure. 
and I'm thinking of getting married again. Just like all you other fools out there, I'm going to risk a little security for a certain amount of adventure. Think it over. Urban guard. Your hat. My hat. Quick, your hat's at the station. We're running away. We're running away. Shh. Where? To New York, to get married. Oh, Ambrose, I can't do that, Ambrose dear. It wouldn't be proper. Listen, I'm taking you to my friend's house. His wife will take care of you. But a girl can't go on a train with a man. I can feed or know anything about girls. But I'm telling you. We're going to get married. Married? What would Uncle say? We don't care. We don't care what Uncle would say. We're eloping. Ambrose Kemper, how could you use such an awful word? I regard you have the soul of a field mouse. <laughs> Ambrose, why do you say such cruel things to me? For the last time, I beg you, get your hat and coat. The train leaves in a minute. Ermengarde, we'll get married tomorrow. Oh, Ambrose, I can see you don't understand anything about weddings. Ambrose, don't you respect me? Oh, good morning, darling child. Good morning, Mrs. Levi. And who is this gentleman who's so devoted to you? This is Mr. Kemper, Mrs. Levi. Ambrose, this is... Mrs. Levi, she said, old friend. <laughs> Dolly Levi, born Gallagher. Very happy to meet you, Mr. Kemper. Good morning, Mrs. Levi. Mr. Kemper, the artist? <laughs> Delighted. Mr. Kemper, may I say something very quickly? <coughs> yes, Mrs. Levi. This thing that you're planning to do is a very great mistake. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Levi, please tell Ambrose. Of course, I want to get married. But to a low How? Uh, now, my dear groom, you go in and keep one eye on your uncle. Now I wish to talk to Mr. Kemper for a moment. You give us a warning when you hear Uncle Horace coming. Yes, Mrs. Levi. Mr. Kemper, I was this dear girl's mother's oldest friend. <laughs> Believe me, I am on your side. I hope that you two will be married very soon, and I think that I can say I can be of real service to you. Mr. Kemper, I always go right to the point. What is the point, Mrs. Levi? Uh, Mr. Vandergelder is a very rich man, Mr. Kemper, and Ermengarde is his only relative. Uh, I'm not interested in Mr. Vandergelder's money. I, I have enough to support a wife and family. Enough? How much is enough when one's thinking about children in the future? The future is the most expensive luxury in the world, Mr. Kemper. Mrs. Levi, what is the point? Believe me, Mr. Vandergelder wishes to get rid of Ermengarde. And if you follow my suggestions, well, he will even permit you to marry her. You see, Mr. Vandergelder is thinking of getting married himself. What? That monster? Oh, Mr. Kemper. Married? To you, Mrs. Levi? Oh, no, no, no. I'm merely arranging it. I'm helping him find a suitable bride. For Mr. Vandergelder, there are no suitable brides. Oh, ah. I think we can safely say that Mr. Vandergelder will be married to someone by the end of next week. What are you suggesting, Mrs. Levi? I'm taking Ermengarde to New York on the next train. I shall not take her to Miss Van Heusen's as is planned. I shall take her to my house. I wish you to call for her at my house at 5.30. Here's my card. This is Dolly Gallagher Levi. Varicose veins reduced. Oh, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. Consultation's free. <laughs> I meant to give you my other card. Here. This is Dolly Gallagher Levi, Aurora Hosiery, instruction in the guitar and mandolin. You do all of these things, Mrs. Levi? Uh, two and two make four, Mr. Kemper. Always did. Anyway, you will come to my house at 5.30. At about 6, I will take you both with me to the Harmonia Gardens restaurant on the Battery. Mr. Vandergelder will be there and everything will be arranged. How? Oh, um, I don't know. One thing will lead to another. 
How do I know I can trust you, Mrs. Levi? You could easily make our situation worse. <laughs> Mr. Kemper, your situation cannot possibly be worse. I wish I knew what you'd get out of this, Mrs. Levi. Well, that is a very proper question. I get two things, profit and pleasure. How? Mr. Kemper, I'm a woman who arranges things. At present, I'm arranging Mr. Vandergelder's domestic affairs. Out of it, I get, shall we call it, little pickings. Oh, I need little pickings, Mr. Kemper, especially just now when I haven't got my train fare back to New York. You see, I'm frank with you. That's your profit, Mrs. Levi. But where do you get your pleasure? My pleasure? Mr. Kemper, when you artists paint a hillside or a river, you change everything just a little. You make hundreds of little changes, don't you? <laughs> Nature is never completely satisfactory and must be corrected. Well, I'm like you artists. Life as it is is never quite interesting enough for me. I'm bored, Mr. Kemper, with life as it is, and so I do things. I put my hand in there, and I put my hand in there, and I watch, and I listen, <laughs> and often I'm very much amused. <laughs> Not in my affairs, Mrs. Levi. Oh, I haven't finished. There's another thing. I'm very interested in this household here, and Mr. Vandergelder and all of that idle, frozen money of his. I don't like the thought of it lying around in great piles, useless, motionless. In the bank, Mr. Kemper, money should circulate like rainwater. It should be flowing down among the people, through dressmakers, restaurants, and cabin, setting up a little business here, furnishing a good time there. Do you see what I mean? Yes, I do. New York should be a very happy city, Mr. Kemper, but it isn't. My late husband came from Vienna. Now there's a city that knows this. New York should be more like Vienna and less like a collection of nervous and tired ants. And if you and Ermengarde get a good deal of Mr. Vandergelder's money, I want you to see that it starts flowing in and around a lot of people's lives. And for that reason, I want you to come with me to the Harmonia Gardens restaurant tonight. Mrs. Levi, of course it's coming. Oh, Mr. Kemper, I think you'd better be going. Darling girl, Mr. Kemper and I have had a very good talk. You'll see. Mr. Vandergelder and I will be dancing at your wedding very soon. Oh, Mr. Vandergelder! Oh, I, how handsome you look. Oh, you take my breath away. Oh, yes, my dear girl, I'll see you soon. Oh, Mr. Vandergelder, if only Irene Malloy could see you now. But then, oh, I don't know what's come over you lately. You seem to be growing younger every day. Don't allow me for exaggeration, Mrs. Levi. If a man is careful, there's no reason why he should look old. Oh, you never said a truer word. I'll never see 55 again. Oh, 55? Well, I can see at a glance that you're the type that will be stamping about at 100 and eating five meals a day like my Uncle Harry. At 55, my Uncle Harry was a mere boy. I'm a judge of hands, Mr. Vandergelder. Show me your hands. Lord in heaven, what a lifeline! Where? From here to here. It runs right off your hand. I don't know where it goes. They'll have to hit you on the head with a mallet. They'll have to stifle you with a soap pillow. Oh, you bury us all. <laughs> However, to return to our business, Mr. Vandergelder, I suppose you've changed your mind again. I suppose you've given up all idea of getting married. Uh, not at all, Mrs. Levi. In fact, I have news for you. News? Mrs. Levi. I practically decided to ask Mrs. Malloy to be my wife. You have? <laughs> yes, I have. Oh, you have. Well, I guess that's just about the best news I ever heard. <laughs> so there's nothing more for me to do but wish you every happiness under the sun and say goodbye. Well, now, oh. surely I thought. Well, I did have a little suggestion to make, but I won't. You're going to marry Irene Malloy, and that closes the matter. What suggestion was that, Mrs. Levi? <laughs> well, I had found another girl for you. Another? The most wonderful girl. The ideal wife. Another, eh? What's her name? Her name? Yes. <laughs> oh, her name! Um, Ernestina Simple. Oh, Miss Ernestina Simple. But now, of course, all that's too late. After all, you're engaged. Well, you're practically engaged to marry Irene Malloy. Oh, I'm engaged to Mrs. Malloy. Oh, nonsense. 
When a man at your time of life calls four times on an attractive widow like that and sends her a pot of geraniums, why, that's practically an engagement. <laughs> that ain't an engagement. Oh, and yet, if only you were free. Oh, I found this treasure of a girl. Every moment I felt like a traitor to Irene Malloy, but let me tell you, I couldn't help it. I told this girl all about you just as though you were a free man. Isn't that dreadful? The fact is, she has fallen in love with you already. Ernestina? Ernestina Simple. Ernestina Simple? Of course, she's a very different idea from Mrs. Malloy, Ernestina is. Like her name. Simple, domestic, uh, practical. Can she cook? Uh, can she cook? Uh, Mr. Vandergelder, I've had two meals from her hands, and as I live, I don't know what I've done that God should reward me with such meals. I'm the best cook in the world myself, and I know what's good. How old is she, Mrs. Levi? Nineteen. Well, say twenty. Twenty? Twenty, Mrs. Levi. <laughs> Girls of twenty are apt to favor younger fellows of their own age. But you don't listen to me, and you don't know the girl. Mr. Vandergelder, she has a positive horror of flighty, brainless young men. A fine head of grave hair, she says, is worth twenty shined up with goose grease. No, sir. I'd like a man that's settled. In so many words, she said it. That's, uh, that's not usual, Mrs. Levi. Usual? I am not wearing myself to the bone hunting down usual girls to interest you, Mr. Vandergelder. Usual, indeed. Listen to me. Do you know the sort of pictures she has on her walls? Is it any of those young Romeos or Locking Bars? No. It's Moses on the mountain. That's what she's got. If you want to make her happy, you give her a picture of Methuselah surrounded by his grandchildren. That's my advice to you. What about her family? Her father. Oh, God be good to him. He was the best, what am I trying to say? The best undertaker in Brooklyn. Respected, esteemed. He knew all the best people. Knew them well, even before they died. So, well, that's the way it is. Now, let me tell you of her appearance. Can you hear me as I say, a beautiful girl? Beautiful. I've seen her walk down the street. You know what I mean? The young men get dizzy. They have to lean against lampposts. And she, modest, eyes on the ground. Oh, couldn't you come to New York today? Oh, I was thinking of coming to New York this uh, afternoon. Oh, you were? Oh, well, now I wonder if something could be arranged. She's so eager to see you. Let me see. Could I, Mrs. Levi, could I give you two date ladies a little dinner, maybe? Really? Well, come to think of it, I don't see where I could find the time. Oh, I'm so busy over that wretched lawsuit of mine. If I win it, and I don't mind telling you, I'll what's be called a very rich woman. I'll own half of Long Island. That's a fact. But just now, I'm at my wit's end for a little help. Just enough money to finish it off. My wit's end! <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose I could arrange a little dinner. We'll see. Yes, just fifty dollars and Staten Island's as good as mine. Oh, I've been trotting all over New York for you, trying to find you a suitable bride. Fifty dollars? Two whole months I've been... Fifty dollars, Mrs. Levi, is no joke. I don't know where money's gone to these days. It's in hiding. Well, here's 20. <laughs> here's 25. I can't spare no more. <laughs> Not now I can't. Well, this will help. Will help somewhat. Now, let me tell you what we'll do. I'll bring Ernestina to that restaurant on the Battery. You know it, the Harmonia Gardens. It's good, but it's not flashy. Now, Mr. Vandergelder, I think it would be nice if just this once you ordered a real nice dinner. I guess you can afford it. <laughs> well, just this once. A chicken wouldn't hurt. Chicken? <laughs> well, just this once. <laughs> and a little wine. Wine? <laughs> just this once. Now, about Mrs. Malloy, what do you think? Shall we call that subject? Closed? Oh, not at all, Mrs. Levi. I, I want to have dinner with Miss... Um, Miss... Simple. With Miss Simple. But first I want to have another call on Mrs. Malloy. Oh, dear, 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 and Miss Simple? Oh, what races you make me run. 
Very well. I'll meet you on one of those benches in front of Mrs. Malloy's hat shops, as usual. The buggy's here, ready for the parade, Mr. Van Geller. Go on and call Barnaby. I want to talk to both of you. Yes, Mr. Van Geller. Now do put your thoughts in order, Mr. Vandergelder. I can't keep upsetting and disturbing the finest women in New York unless you mean business. Oh, I mean business, all right. Oh, I should hope so. Because, you know, you're playing a very dangerous game. Dangerous? Dangerous, Mrs. Levi? Of course it's dangerous. And there's a name for it. You're tampering with these women's affections, aren't you? And the only way you can save yourself now is to be married to someone by the end of next week. So think that over. This morning I'm joining my large parade. This afternoon I'm going to New York. Now, before I go, I want to talk to you about some changes in the household. You're going to have a mistress. Aren't you young, Mr. Vandergelder? Not yours, idiots! Not yours! Death and damnation! Not yours! Mine! Hey, hold your tongue until you're spoken to. I'm thinking of getting married again. Many congratulations, Mr. Van Geller. And my compliments to the lady. That's none of your business. Now, go back into the store. Have you any questions before I go? Um, Mr. Van Geller. Um, Mr. Van Geller. Does the chiefler get one evening off every week? So that's the way you begin being chief clerk, is it? Let me tell you something. When I was your age, I got up at five. I didn't close the store until ten at night, and then I put in a good hour of work at the account books. You elegant ladies lie in bed until six, and at nine o'clock at night, you rush to close the door so fast that the line of customers bark their noses. No, sir! You'll attend to the store as usual, and on Friday and Saturday nights you'll remain open until ten. Now, hear what I say. This is the first time I've been away from the store overnight. In my absence, I want to hear that you run the place perfectly. Now, if I hear of any foolishness, I'll discharge you. Ah, an evening free? Do you suppose that I had evenings free? If I had evenings free, I wouldn't be the man I am now. The horses nearly ran away when they saw him. What's the matter, Cornelius? Chief Clerk! Promoted from Chief Clerk to Chief Clerk! Don't you like it? Chief Clerk! And if I'm good in ten years, I'll be promoted to Chief Clerk again. Thirty-three years old, and I still don't, and I still don't get an evening free? <laughs> When am I going to begin to live? Well, uh, you can begin to live on Sundays, Cornelius. That's not living! Twice at church, and old wolf drops eyes on the back of my head the whole time. And as for holidays, what did, what did we do last Christmas? All those cans of mayos went bad and exploded! We had to clean up that mess all afternoon. Was that living? No! <laughs> Pardon me. How much money have we got? Where are you going to get at it? Oh, three dollars. Why, Cornelius? You and I are going to New York. Cornelius, we can't close the store. Some more uh, rotten tomatoes are going to explode. Holy cabooses, how do you know? I know they're rotten. All you have to do is light a match under them. That makes such a smell that customers can't come into the place for 24 hours. That'll give us an evening free. We're going to New York too, Barbie. We're going to live. I'm going to have enough adventures to last me until I'm partner. So go and get your Sunday clothes on. What? Yes, I mean it. We're going to have a good meal. And we're going to be in danger. And we're going to be almost arrested. And we're going to spend all our money. Holy cabooses. And one more thing. We're not coming back to Yonkers until we've kissed a girl. Kissed a girl? Cornelius, you can't do that. You don't know any girls. I'm 33. I've got to begin sometime. I'm only 17, Cornelius. 
It isn't so urgent for me. Don't start backing now, now. If the worst comes to the worst, and we get discharged from here, we can always join the army. Uh, did I hear you say you'd be old Wolf Chap's partner? How can I help it? He's getting old. If you go to bed at nine and open the door at six, you get promoted upwards, what do you like, whether you like it or not. My partner. Oh, there's no way of getting away from it. You and I will be banner killers. I, oh no, I may rise a little, but I'll never be a Van der Gelder. Listen, you and I are going to be going to be Van der Gelders. All the more reason then for us to try and get some living and some adventure into us now. Will you come, Barnaby? But Wolf Trap, mm, good trip. Yes, Cornelius! <laughs> Mr. Hackle, is the trunk waiting at the railroad station? Yes, Mrs. Levi. Take a last look, Ermengarde. What? Take one last look at your girlhood home, dear. Oh, I remember when I left my home. I gave a whinny like a young colt, and off I went. <laughs> you know, I think I'm going to have this room with Blue wallpaper. <laughs> yes, in blue. All clear up here, Cornelius. Cornelius, hold the candle steady a minute. The bottom rolls are right, but try the top now. This sweat would like to ready to bust. Holy cabooses! Get to something close, Barnaby. We're going to New York. Out there on that bench. Uh, 
Take my word for it, Minnie. Either I marry a horse down together or I break out this place like a fire engine. I'll go to every ball and opera and theater in New York City. But Mr. Vandergelder's not. Speak up, Minnie. I can't hear you. I don't think he's attractive. But what I think he is, it's very important. I think he'd make a good fighter. Mrs. Malloy. Take my word for it, Minnie. The best in married life is the fights. The rest is merely so-so. I won't listen. Peter Malloy, God rest him, was a fine arguing man. I pity the woman whose husband slams the door and walks out at the beginning of an argument. Peter Malloy would stand up and fight for hours on end. He'd even throw things, Minnie, and there's no pleasure to equal that. When I felt tired, I'd start a good blood-warming fight and take ten years off my age. Now, Horace Vandergeller, Horace Vandergeller would put up a good fight. I know it. I would like to marry him. I think they're just awful, the things you're saying today. Mrs. Malloy, those two men out in the street. What? Those men. It looks as if they're meant to come in here. Well, now it's time some men came into this place. I give you the younger one, Minnie. Aren't you terrible? Wait till I get my hands on that older one. Fuck my words, Minnie. We'll get an adventure out of this yet. Adventure, adventure. Why does everyone have adventures except for me, Minnie? It's because I have no spirit. I have no gumption. Minnie, they're coming in here. Let's go into the workroom and have them wait for us for a bit. Oh, but Mrs. Malloy, my work. Come on, Minnie, be quick now. No one's here. Some women were here a minute ago. I saw them. Oh, that's Wolf Trap, all right. Well, we've got to hide here until he passes by. He's sitting down on that bench. It may be quite a while. When these women come in, we'll have to make conversation until he's gone away. We'll pretend we're a buying hat. How much money have you got now? Forty cents for the train, seventy cents for dinner, twenty cents to see the whale, and a dollar I lost. I have seventy cents, and I have a dollar seventy-five. I wish I knew much has cost. Is this an adventure, Cornelius? No, <laughs> but maybe. I think it is. There we wander around New York and nothing happens. And then we come to the quietest street in all of New York City and suddenly Mr. Vandergelder turns the corner. I think it's an adventure. I think Cornelius that Miss Levi is there now. She's sitting down on the bench with him. What do you know about that? We know only one person in all New York City and there she is. Even if our adventure came along now, <sighs> I'd be too tired to enjoy it. Cornelius, why isn't this an adventure? Don't be asking that. When you're in an adventure, you'll know it right. Maybe I wouldn't, Cornelius. Let's arrange a signal for you to give me when adventure's really going on. For instance, Cornelius, you say, uh, uh, pudding! You say pudding to me if it's an adventure. I wonder where the lady who runs the store is. Uh, what's her name again? Uh, Mrs. Malloy. Hats for ladies. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I must think over what I'm going to say to her when she comes in. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mrs. Malloy. Wonderful weather we're having. We've been looking everywhere for some beautiful hats. That's fine, Cornelius. Good afternoon, Mrs. Malloy. Wonderful weather. We'll make her think that we're very rich. Good afternoon, Mrs. Malloy. You keep one eye on the door the whole time. We've been looking everywhere for it. Oh, I'm sorry. Have I kept you waiting? Good afternoon. Here, Cornelius Hacker. Here, Barnaby Tucker. Pleasure to meet you. Uh, perhaps I can help you. Won't you sit down? Thank you. We will. You see, Mrs. Malloy. <laughs> We've been looking for hats. We looked everywhere. You know what we heard? Go to Mrs. Moy, they said. So we came here. Only place we have uh, could. Why, now that's very complimentary. And we were right. Everybody is right. We wish to choose some hats for a friend? Yes. 
Exactly. Yes, exactly. We're thinking about five or six of what we Barnaby? Uh, five. You see, Mrs. Malloy, money's an option with us. None at all. Why, Mr. Hackle? I beg your pardon, Mrs. Malloy. What an interesting street. Something happening every minute. Passerby. And... You're from out of town, Mr. Hackle? Yes, ma'am. Barnaby, just keep your eye on the street, will you? You won't see that in Yonkers every day. Oh, yes, I will. Not all of it. This friend of yours, couldn't she come in with you someday and choose her hats herself? No. Oh, no. It's a surprise for her. Indeed. That may be a little difficult, Mr. Hackle. It's not entirely customary. Um, your friend is very interested in the street, Mr. Hackle. Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes. Uh, he has a reason to be. You said you were from out of town? Yes. We're from Yonkers. Yonkers? Yonkers. Yes. Yonkers. <laughs> oh, you should know Yonkers, Mrs. Moy. Hudson River, Palisades, Drives. Some say it's the most beautiful town in the world. That's what they say. Is that so? Mrs. Moy, if you ever had a Sunday free, I weed. Like to show you Yonkers. You know? <coughs> it's very historic too. That's very kind of you. Well, perhaps. Uh, now about those hats. Is there um have you um maybe Mr. Malloy would like to see Yonkers too? Oh, I'm a widow, Mr. Hackle. You are! <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Uh, Mr. Molloy would have enjoyed Yonkers. Very likely. Um, now, this friend of yours, what color are her eyes? Don't be thinking about that for a minute. Any hat you like would be perfectly all right. Really? What about this one? Barnaby. Barnaby, look. <laughs> this is Malloy. That's the most beautiful hat I ever saw. Your friend's acting very strangely, Mr. Hackle. Barnaby! Stop acting strangely! When the street's quiet and empty, come back and talk to us. What was I saying? Oh, yes. Mrs. Malloy, you should know, you should know Yonkers. The fact is, I have a friend in Yonkers, and perhaps you know him. It's always so foolish to ask in cases like that, isn't it? <laughs> it's a Mr. Vandergelder. <laughs> what was it you said? Then you do know him. Horace Vandergelder? Yes, that's right. Know him? Why? No, 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 no. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Boy. What an attractive shop you have. And where does this door lead to? Why, Mr. Hackle, that's my workroom. Everything here is so interesting. Every door, every corner, Mrs. Molloy. Barnaby, notice the interesting doors and tables. Deeply interesting. Coats for ladies. Barnaby, make it a note the table. Precious piece of furniture with a low hanging cloth, I see. But perhaps your friend might be interested in some of this new Italian straw. Mr. Vandergelder is a very substantial man and very well liked, they tell me. A lovely man, a lovely man, Mrs. Mulan. Oh, yes, charming, charming. Has only one fault. As far as I know, he's hard as nails. But apart from that, a charming nature, ma'am. And a large circle of uh, friends? Yes, indeed. Five or six. Pfft, five! <laughs> he comes and calls on you here from time to time, I suppose. Yes, this summer we'll be wearing ribbons down our backs. As a matter of fact, I'm expecting a call from him this afternoon. I think, Cornelius, I think. Now to show you some more hats. Look out! <gasps> I beg your pardon, Mrs. Floyd. Gentlemen! Mr. Hackle! What are you doing? Help us just as once, Mrs. Moy. We'll explain later. Mr. Hackle! Where's innocence can be, Miss Malloy? But gentlemen, really, I can't have this. What are you doing? Cornelius, Cornelius! Pudding! Pudding! <laughs> oh, I'm my darling child. How are you? 
Oh, heaven be good to us, how well you look. Oh, what a surprise, and Mr. Vandergelder in New York, a pleasure. Good afternoon, Mrs. Malloy. <laughs> yes, Mr. Vandergelder is in New York. Yonkers lies up there decimated today. We thought we'd pay you a very short call. Now, you'll tell us if it's inconvenient, won't you? Inconvenient? Dolly, the idea! Why, it's sweet of you to come. We waited outside a moment. Oh, Mr. Vandergelder thought he saw two customers coming in. Two men? Men? <laughs> men, Mr. Vandergelder? Why, what will you be thinking next? Then, we'll just sit down for a minute or two. Uh, before you sit down, before you sit down, <laughs> I have something I'd like to show you. I'd like to show Mr. Vandergelder my workroom. Oh, I've seen the workroom a hundred times. I'll stay right here and try on some of these uh, things. No, Dolly, you come too. I have something for you. <laughs> come along, everyone. <laughs> Mr. Vandergelder, I need your advice. You don't know how helpless a woman in business is. Why, I feel as if I need advice every minute from a fine business head like yours. Now I shut the door! <laughs> Psst. Maybe she wants us to go, Cornelius. <laughs> Certainly I won't go. Mrs. Malloy would think we're just foolish fellows. No. All we want is to stretch a minute. What are we going to do when Mr. Vandergelder goes, Cornelius? Are we just going to run away? Well, I don't know yet. I like Mrs. Malloy a lot. I wouldn't like her to think badly of me. I think I'll buy a hat. We can walk home to Yonkers, even if it takes us all night. I wonder how much hats it costs. Barnaby, give me the, the, the money you got. So My, all those perfumes in that cupboard tip my nose. What do I like it in there? It's a woman's world and very different. I like how I am too. Only, I like it better if I had a pillow. Nah. Here, take one of these coats. I'll roll it up for you so it won't get must. Ladies do not like to have their coats must. That's fine. Now, I can just lie here and hear Mr. Vandergelder talk. This summer will be wearing ribbons down her backs. Can I take my shoes off, Cornelius? <laughs> Isn't the world full of wonderful things? There we sit, cooked up in Yonkers for years and years. And all the time, wonderful people like Mrs. Malloy are walking around in New York, and we don't know them at all. I don't know whether, from where you're sitting, you can see. Well, for instance, the way her eye and forehead and cheek come together up here, can you? And the kind of fireworks that shoot out of her eyes all the time. I tell you right now, a fine woman is the greatest <coughs> God. You can talk. All you like about Niagara Falls and the pyramids, they aren't in it at all. Of course, up there at Yonkers, they came into the store all the time. About this and that, and I said, yes ma'am, and that'll be 75 cents ma'am, and I watched them. But today, I talked to one, equal to equal, equal to equal, and it's the finest one that ever existed, in my opinion. They're so different from men. Why? Everything that I see and do with such a room, they feel like laughing all the time. Golly, they're different from men. And they're awfully mysterious, too. You never can be really sure what's going on in their heads. They have a kind of wall around them all the time. A pride and a sort of planting. I bet you could know a woman a hundred years without ever being really sure whether she liked you or not. This minute, I'm in danger. I'm in danger of losing my job, my future, and everything that people think is important. But I don't care. 
even if I have to dig ditches for the rest of my life, I'll be a dish digger who once had a wonderful day. Barnaby. Barnaby! Oh, you woke me up. Barnaby, we can't go back to Yonkers yet, and you know why. I'm not. We've had a good meal. We've had an adventure. We've been in danger of getting arrested. There's only one more thing we have to do before we go back to be successes in Yonkers. Cornelius, you're never going to kiss Miss Malloy. Maybe. <laughs> but she'll scream. Barnaby, you don't know anything at all. You might as well know that everybody except us goes through life kissing left and right all the time. Oh, thanks for telling me, Cornelius. I often wonder. Just a minute, Irene. I must find my handkerchief. <laughs> Why, Mr. Hackle, I thought you were up in Yonkers. I almost always am, Mrs. Levi. Oh, Mrs. Levi. Please don't tell Mr. Van Gelder. I'll explain later. We're as innocent, we're as innocent as you be, Miss Levi. Well, who's that? Bind me, Tucker. Just paying a call. Well, who else is here? Just the two of us. Just the two of us, Mrs. Levi. That's all. Old friends of Mrs. Malloy's, is that it? We never knew her before a few minutes ago, but we like her a lot. Don't we, Barnaby? In fact, uh, I think she's, uh, I think she's the finest person in the world. I'm ready to tell that to anybody. And does she think that you're the finest person in the world? Oh, no. I don't think she even notices that I'm alive. Well, I'm sure she must notice that you're alive in that cupboard, Mr. Hackle. If I were you, I'd get back into it right away. Someone could be coming in any minute. Dolly. Oh, no, no, I was just, just blowing my nose. Mrs. Malloy, I've got some advice to give you about your business. Uh, advice from Mr. Vandergelder? Why, the whole city should hear this. In the first place, the aim of business is to make profit. Is that so? I never heard it put so clearly before. Did you hear it? <laughs> you pay those girls of yours too much. You pay them as much as men. Girls like that enjoy their work. The wages, Mrs. Malloy, are paid to make people do the work they don't want to do. <laughs> Mr. Vandergelder thinks so ably, and that's exactly how his business is run up in Yonkers. <laughs> Mrs. Malloy, I'd like for you to come up to Yonkers. I'd like that very much. Oh, thank you. The fact is, I know someone from Yonkers, uh, someone else. Oh, who's that? Someone quite well to do, I believe, though a bit free and easy in his behavior. Uh, Mr. Hackle, do you know a Cornelius Hackle in Yonkers? I know him like my own boot. He's my head clerk. Is that so? He's been in my store for ten years now. Well, I never. Where would you have known? Oh, uh, just one of those uh, chance meetings, I suppose. Yes, oh yes, one of those chance meetings. What? <laughs> chance meetings? <laughs> Cornelius Hackle has no right to chance meetings. Where was it? But really, Mr. Vandergelder, it's unlike you to question me in such a way. I think Mr. Hackle is no more known than you think he is. Nonsense! <laughs> he's in New York often, and he's very well liked. Well, the truth might as well come out now as later. Mr. Vandergelder, Irene is quite right. Your head clerk is often in New York, goes everywhere, has an army of friends. Why, everyone knows Cornelius Hackle. <laughs> He never comes to New York. He works all day in my store, and then he, nine o'clock at night, he goes to sleep in the brand room. So you think, but it's not true. Dolly Gallagher, you're crazy. Listen to me. You keep your nose so deep in your account books, you don't know what goes on. Yes, by day, Cornelius Hackle is your faithful, trusted clerk. That's true. But by night, well, he leads a double life, that's all. He's here at the opera, at the great restaurants, in all the fashionable homes. Why, he's at the Harmonia Gardens restaurant three nights a week. 
The fact is, Cornelius Hackel is the wittiest, gayest, naughtiest, most delightful man in New York. He's just the famous Cornelius Hackel. It ain't the same man. If I ever thought Cornelius Hackle came to New York, I'd discharge him. Who took the horses out of Jenny Lynn's carriage and pulled her through the streets? Who? Cornelius Hackle. Who dressed up like a waiter at the Fifth Avenue Hotel the other night and took an oyster and dropped it right down Mrs. Oh no, it's too wicked to tell you. Oh yes, Dolly, go on, do tell it! Yes, no. <laughs> but it was Cornelius Hackle. It ain't the same man. Where'd he get the money? But he's very rich. Rich? <laughs> Rich, I keep his money in my own safe. He has $146.35. Oh, oh, Mr. Vandergelder, you're killing me. Oh, do come to your senses. He's one of the hackles. The hackles? They built the Raritan Canal. Then why should he work in my store? Well, I'll tell you. I don't want to hear. I've got a headache. I'm going home. It ain't the same man. He sleeps in my brand room. You can't get away from the facts. I just made him my chief clerk. If you had any sense, you'd make him partner. Now, Irene, I can tell that you were just as taken by him as everybody else is. Oh, I only met him once, very hastily. Yes, but I could see that you were taken by him. Now, don't you be thinking of marrying him. Oh, Dolly, the idea! Oh. Maybe it would fine. But think it over carefully. He breaks hearts like hickory nuts. Who? Cornelius Hackle. Mrs. Malloy, how often has he called on you? Why, I'm telling the truth. Uh, Dolly Levi's been exaggerating, so I've only seen him once in my life. I, I don't know where to look. Excuse me, Mrs. Malloy. I must get together that order for Mrs. Parkinson. Yes, we must get that off before closing. I want to send it off by the errand girl. Oh. I almost forgot the coat. Oh, Minnie, Minnie, no, I'll do that, Minnie! Kiss the Lord! Coat! There's a man! Little Minnie, you imagined it. <laughs> There's a man! You're tired, Minnie. There's a man! Go into the workroom and lie down. There's a man! Minnie, you're a fool. There's a man! Oh, your dog! There's a man! If there's a man in there, we'll get him out. Whoever you are, come out of there. Oh, nonsense! Oh, there's no man in there. See? Oh, Miss Faye's nerves have been playing tricks on her. Come now, let's sit down. Now, Mr. Vandergelder, what were you saying? Well, now. God bless you. Yes, there is a man in there. I'll explain it all to you another time. Uh, thank you very much for your visit. Uh, good afternoon, Dolly. Good afternoon, Mr. Vandergelder. You're protecting a man in there. There's a very simple explanation, but for the present, good afternoon. <laughs> Lord, the room's crawling with men. Oh, I'll never get over it. The world's falling to pieces. I can't believe my own eyes. Come, Mr. Vandergelder. Ernestina Simple is waiting for us. <laughs> Mrs. Malloy, I shan't trouble you again, and vice versa. <laughs> Irene, when I think of all the interesting things you have in this room. Make the most of it, dear. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> so that was one of your practical jokes, Mr. Hackle. No, no, this is Come out from there, Barnaby Tucker, you troublemaker! It's all right, Minnie. There's nothing to be afraid of. I know all about these gentlemen. Mrs. Moy, we realize what happened. You think that because you're rich, you can go around and make up for all the trouble you cause? Is that it? No, 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 no. Minnie, this is the famous Cornelius Hackle who goes around New York tying people into knots, and that's Barnaby Tucker, another troublemaker. How do you do? Minnie, choose yourself any pack of coat in the store you'd like. We're going out for dinner. If this Mr. Hackle is so rich and gay and charming, he's going to be rich and gay and charming to us. He dines three nights a week at the Harmonia Gardens, now does he? 
Well, he's taking us there now. Mrs. <coughs> Malloy, are you sure it's safe? Hold your tongue, Minnie. We're in a position to put these men into jail if they so much as squeak. Jail? Mrs. Malloy? Jail? Jail! Officer Corky does everything I tell him to. Minnie, you and I have been respected for years, and now we're in disgrace. We might as well make the most of it. Let's go into the workroom. I know some ways we can perk up our appearance. So, gentlemen, we'll be back in a minute. Uh, Mrs. Malloy, uh, I hear there's an awfully good restaurant at the railway station. Railway station? Railway station? Certainly not, no sir. You're going to take us out at the most fashionable place of all town. Don't forget that you boys made us lose our reputations and the fashionable world is, only, is the only place we can eat. She's angry at us, Cornelius. Maybe we better run away now. No! I'm going to go through with this even if it kills me. Pardon me. For a woman like that, a man could get sent to go back to Yonkers and be a success. All I know is no woman's going to make success out of me. <laughs> jail or no jail, we're taking those ladies out to the dinner. So grit your teeth. Gentlemen, the cabs are at the corner, so forward march. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Mrs. Malloy, is it far to the restaurant? Uh, couldn't we walk? Take off your things, Minnie. We're not going. Mrs. Mrs. Malloy! Mr. Hackle, I do not go anywhere. I'm not wanted. Good night. I'm not very happy to have met you. Mrs. Malloy! I bet you think that we're not fashionable enough for you, do you? Well, I won't be a burden to you. Good night, Mr. Tucker. We want you to come with us for them. anything in the world, Mrs. Malloy. No, you don't! Minnie, look at them! Look at the pair of them! Scowling, both of them! Please, Mrs. Malloy! Then smile! Go on, smile! <laughs> no, that's not enough. Minnie, you come with me and we'll get our own supper. Smile, Barnaby, Lout. My face can't smell any stronger than that. Then do something. Show some interest. Do something lively. Sing. Oh, I can't sing. Really, I can't. We're wasting our time, Minnie. They don't want us. Barnaby, what can we sing? This is Malloy. All we know are sad songs. That doesn't matter. If you want us to go out with you, you've got to sing something. We're tenting tonight on the old campground, thinking of days gone by. Of the loved ones at home that gave us the hand, and the tear that said goodbye. We're tenting tonight on the old campground, thinking of days gone by. Of the loved ones at home that gave us the hand, and the tear that said goodbye. Welcome. <sighs> you boys go ahead. Minnie, get the front door key. I'll lock the workroom. Removed. 
Well, you get this table alone. There are some people coming in here now, Mr. Van der Gelder. What? Thunder and damnation, that money's out of guard. What's she doing here? We look at my hands on her. Mr. Van der Gelder, you must keep your temper. <laughs> and there's that rascal artist with her. What are they doing here? It's a plot. I'll throw them in jail. They're old enough to come to New York. Can't throw people in a jail for coming to New York. And there's Mrs. Levi with them. What's she doing here with, uh, it's a plot. It's a conspiracy. What's she saying to the cabman? Go up and hear what she's saying. She's telling the cabman to wait, Mr. Mandegelda. She's telling the young people to come in and have a good dinner, Mr. Mandegelda. I'll put an end to this. If you lose your temper, you'll make matters worse. Mr. Vandergelda, come here and take my advice. What? Uh, stop pulling my coat. What's your advice? Hi, Mr. Vandergelda. <laughs> Hide behind this screen and listen to what they say. Stop pulling at me. Yeah. I don't want to eat in a restaurant. It's not proper. Now, Ermengarde, dear, there's nothing wicked about eating in a restaurant. There's nothing wicked even about being in New York. Clergymen just make those things up to fill out their sermons. Oh, I wish we were, oh, I wish we were back in Yonkers where nothing ever happened. Ermengarde, you're hungry. That's what's troubling you. Anyway, after dinner, you must promise to take me to Aunt Flora's. She's been waiting for me all day and must be half dead of fright. All right. But of course, you know that at Miss Van Heusen's, you'll be right back in your uncle's hands. I can't stand it. Just keep telling yourself how pretty she is. Pretty girls have very little opportunity to improve their other advantages. Listen, Irvingard, you don't want to go back to your uncle. Stop and think. That man with one foot in the grave. And the other three in the cash box. Smelling of oats. Oh, and Axel agrees. <laughs> That's not true. That's only part of it. Hold your tongue. I'm gonna teach them a lesson. Keep your voice down. Listen to what they say. Oh dear, oh Lord be praised. How glad I am that I found you two dreadful children, just as you are about to break poor dear Mr. Vandergelder's heart. He has no heart to break. Uh, Mr. Vandergelder's a much kinder man than you might think. Kinder? He's a wolf. Remember that he leads a very lonely life. Now, the two of you will have dinner uh, upstairs. Oh, so there are some lovely private rooms upstairs, just meant for shy, timid girls like Ermengarde. Come with me. I'll show them. Everyone should eavesdrop once in a while. That's what I always say. <laughs> Nothing like eavesdropping. I'm show you that the world outside your head is different than the one inside your head. <laughs> I want to write a note. Go on and call that care man in here. I want to talk to him. Mr. Van Gelder, <laughs> nobody asks the advice of a care man. They see so much of the world that they have no ideas left. Do as I tell you. Yes, sir. Advice of a care man. <laughs> My dear Miss Van Heusen. Everybody's dear in a letter. It's enough to make you give up writing them. <laughs> My dear Miss Van Hughes, this is Ermengard and that rascal Ambrose Kemper. They are trying to run away. Keep them in your house until I come. What's he want? I want to talk to you. I'm engaged. I'm waiting for my party. I know you are. Do you want to earn five dollars? Yeah. I asked you, do you want to earn five dollars? I don't know. I never tried. When those parties of yours come from downstairs, drive them to this address. Never mind what they say, drive them to this address. Ring the bell, give this letter to the lady of the house, see that they get in the door, and keep them there. 
I can't make people go to a house if they don't want to. Can you for ten dollars? Even for ten dollars, I can't do it alone. This fellow here will help you. <laughs> now I'm pushing people in houses. There's the address, Miss Flora Van Houston, 8 Jackson Street. Even if I get them in the door, I can't be sure they'll stay there. For fifteen dollars, you can. <laughs> Might if you get to twenty-five dollars. <laughs> Hold your tongue. The lady of the house will help you. All you have to do is sit in the front hall and see that the man does not run off with the girl. Well, I'll be at Miss Van Heusen's in an hour or two, and I'll pay you then. If they call the police, I can't do anything. It's perfectly honest business. Perfectly honest. Every man's the best judge of his own honesty. The young lady is my niece. <laughs> the young lady is my niece. She's trying to run away with a good for nothing, and we're preventing it. Oh, I know them, sir. They'll win in the end. Rivers don't run uphill. What did I tell you, Mr. Vandegelda? Advice of the campaign. Stack! I'll be back in half an hour. See that the table's set for three, see that nobody else eats there, then go and join the cabman on the box. Yes, sir. Who's your friend? <laughs> friend? That's not a friend. That's an employer I've been trying out for a few days. You won't like him. I can see that you're in a business for yourself, because you talk about liking employers. Nobody's liked an employer since business began. Ah, uh, no, sir. Suppose you think your horse likes him. My old Clementine, <laughs> she'd give her right feet for me. <laughs> That's what all employers think. You imagine it. The streets of New York are full of cab horses wanking at each other. Hey, let's go in the kitchen and get some whiskey. I can't push people into houses when I'm sober. <laughs> no. I've had about 50 employees in my life, but this one is the most employee of them all. He talks to everyone like he was paying them. I had an employee once. He watched me from 8 in the morning till 6 at night. Just sat there and watched me. Oh dear, even my mother didn't think I was as interesting as that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, being employed is like being loved. You know, someone's thinking about you the whole time. <laughs> Mrs. Malloy, are you sure you like it here? I, I think I feel a draft. Indeed, I do like it. We're going to have a nice dinner right in this very room. It's private and it's elegant. Now, we're going to forget all our troubles and call each other by our first names. Cornelius, call the waiter. Wait. Wait. I can't make a sound. I must have caught a cold on that ride. Wait. No. It won't come. I don't believe you. Barnaby, you call him. Waiter! Waiter! I never thought I'd be in such a place in my whole life. Mrs. Malloy, is this what they call a cafe? Yes, this is a cafe. Sit down, Lily. Cornelius, Miss Levi gave us to understand that every waiter in New York knew you. <laughs> they will. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, uh, how are you, uh, Frida? How are you, my friend? I am Rudolfa. Of course, Rudolfa, of course. Well, Rudolfa, these ladies want a little something to eat. You know, you know what, you know what I mean? Just if you can find the time. We know how busy you are. Cornelius, there's no need to be so familiar with the waitress. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Yes. Minnie, what do you want to eat? Just anything, Irene. No, speak up, Minnie. What do you want? No, really, I have no appetite at all. Uh, oh. I'd like some sardines on toast with a glass of milk. Great grindstone! What a sensible girl. Barbie, shake Minnie's hands. She's the most sensible girl in the world. Rudolph, bring us gentlemen. Two glasses of beer, a loaf of bread, and some cheese. I've never heard of such nonsense. We're here for 
for a good dinner and a good time. Minnie, have you ever eaten pheasant? Pheasant? No. Rudolpha, have you any pheasant? Yes, ma'am. Just in from New Jersey today. Even the pheasants are leaving New Jersey. <laughs> Rudolpha, write this down. Write this down. Mock turtle soup. The soup. Pheasant. Mm -hmm. Mashed chestnuts. Yeah. And some nice red wine. Then. All right, Barnaby. You watch me. Rudolpha, write this down. Neapolitan ice cream. <laughs> House peaches. Champagne! Champagne! And a German band! Oh, um, have you got a German band? No, Cornelius, I won't let you be so extravagant. Uh, champagne, but no band. And hurry up about this, Rudolpha. We're hungry. Minnie, I've got an idea about your hair. I think it'd be nice in two wee horns. Cool. Cornelius, they say in the army you have to peel potatoes all the time. Oh, that doesn't matter. By the time we get out of jail, we can move right over to the old men's home. Ugh. Waitress, what's that? What's that you have? It's some champagne, ma'am. Cornelius, it's our champagne. Oh, no, no. Bar's honored the mayor of New York, and he's very impatient. But shame on him! The mayor of New York has more important things to be impatient about. Cornelius, take it. Ma'am, if you'll kill me! I go to a public restaurant for the first time in ten years! <laughs> and all the waitresses burst into tears. Um, here, take this, um, Minnie? Barnaby, make a toast. I, uh, to all the ladies in the world, <coughs> may I get to know more of them? And may I get to know them better? Uh, to the uh, ladies. That was very nice and very refined. And many, for that, I'm going to give Barnaby a kiss. Huh? Oh, hold your tongue, Minnie. I'm old enough to be his mother. Barnaby, this is to you from all the ladies in the world. <laughs> now we can go back to Yonkers, Cornelius. Pudding, pudding, pudding! <laughs> Look at Barnaby. He's not strong enough for a kiss. His head can't stand it. <laughs> Minnie, I'm enjoying myself. To think that this goes on every, every night. Well, I sit at home, darning my stockings. <laughs> Cornelius, dance with me. Oh, uh, I read. The heckles don't dance. Or Presbyterians. Minnie, you dance with me. Murphy music? Why, well, Minnie, you dance beautifully. Three girls dance in the workroom while you're not looking, Irene. And you thought I'd be angry. Why, no one in the world understands anyone else in the world. Cornelius. Jenny Lind and all those other ladies. Um, do you see them all over there? Irene, I put them right out of my head. I'm interested in... Rudolpha! What are you doing? The table's been reserved here. Special orders? That table can eat inside! We got here first! This veranda is ours! I'm very sorry. This veranda's open to anyone who wants it. Ah, there comes the man who brought the order. Take your table away from here! We got here first! Cornelius, throw him out. 
Ma'am, my employer was out of this place for four o'clock this afternoon. You can eat in the restaurant. My employer said it was very important you have a table alone. That doesn't matter. We got here first, and we're going to stay here alone, too. Ladies and gentlemen. Shut up, you! You're an impertinent, idiotic, killjoy! <laughs> Well, after I had that weakness of stealing for a while, 
I found another. I took to whiskey. Whiskey took to me. And then I discovered an important rule that I'm going to pass on to you. Never support two weaknesses at the same time. It's your combination sinners, your lecherous liars, and your miserly drunkards that dishonor the vices and put them in a vat of pute. So now you see why I want to get rid of this money. I want to keep my mind free to the credit to whiskey that it deserves. And my last word to you, ladies and gentlemen, is this. One vice at a time. Excuse me, can I speak to you for a minute? Uh, you certainly can. But we all want to apologize to you about that screen, that little misunderstanding. What's your name, sir? Stack, sir. Malachi Stack. A few ladies will excuse me. I'd like to speak to you for a minute. <laughs> have you lost... Hey, come here. Listen, have you lost anything? Mr. Stack, in this one day, I've lost everything I own. Here it is. Don't mention it. <laughs> Why? Mr. Stack, you know what it is? <clears throat> it's a miracle. <sighs> Don't mention it. Barbie, come here a minute. I want you to shake hands with Mr. Stack. Mr. Stack's just around the purse I lost, Barnaby. You know, the parcel of money? You're a wonderful man, Mr. Oh, Stack. <laughs> hey, it's nothing, nothing. I'm certainly glad I went to church all these years. You're a good person to know, Mr. Stack. In a way, Mr. Stack, of uh, where you work? Oh, I've just begun. I work for Mr. Vandegel on Yonkers. <laughs> you do? It's a miracle. Uh, Mr. Stack, I know you don't need it, but can I give you something for, uh, for good work? Oh, don't mention it. It's nothing. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Here, take that. Don't mention it. Oh, then Matt, I'd better be going. Oh, here, Matt. Oh, no, no, I might get to like him. <laughs> Irene. I feel a lot better about everything. I mean, I feel so well that I'm going to tell the truth. <laughs> I've forgotten that many men get drunk so differently from women. <laughs> All right, what's the truth? If I tell the truth, will you let me, uh... Will you let me put my arm around your waist? <laughs> oh, hold your tongue, Minnie. All right, you can put your arm around my waist. Just to show it can be done in a gentlemanly way. But I might as well warn you, a corset is a corset. <laughs> You're a wonderful person, Mrs. Moy. Thank you. All right, so now that's enough. Then. What is the truth? Irene, I'm not as rich as Mrs. Levi said I was. Not rich. I almost never came to New York, and I'm not like she said I was bad. And I think you ought to know what this great man is. Mr. Van is sitting on the other side of that screen. What? Well, he's not going to spoil any party of mine. So that's why we've been whispering. Let's forget all about Mr. Van and have some more wine. Good evening, Mr. Van Where's Where's Miss Simple? Mr. Vandergelder, I'll never trust a woman again as long as I live. Well, what is it? She ran away this afternoon and got married. She did? Married, Mr. Vandergelder, to a young boy of 50. She did? Oh, I'm as disappointed as you are. I can't eat a thing. What have you ordered? I ordered what you told me to. A chicken. Oh, I couldn't face a chicken. A waitress. How do you do? What's your name? Augusta, ma'am. Oh. Augusta, this is Mr. Van of Yonkers. Yonkers' most influential citizen, in fact. I want you to see that he's served with the best you have and served promptly. And there'll only be two of us. Mr. Van has been through some trying experiences lately. What with men hidden all over Mrs. Malloy's store. Mrs. Levi, you don't have to tell her everything about me. 
Now, Mr. Vandergelder, if you're thinking about getting married again, you might as well learn right now that you have to let women be women. Now, Augusta, we want excellent service. Yes, ma'am. You, uh, you've managed things very badly. When I plan a thing, it, it takes place. Where are you going? Oh, I'd just like to see who's on the other side of that screen. Oh, good. Well, who was it? Oh, just some city sparks entertainment, entertaining the girls, I guess. It's always wanting to know everything. It's always curious about everything. Always putting your nose in other people's affairs. Anybody who lived with you would get nervous as a cat. <laughs> what? What's that you're saying? I said anybody who lived with you would Horace get nervous. Horace Vandergelder, get that idea right out of your head. I'm surprised you even mentioned such a thing. Understand once and for all that I have no intention of marrying you. I didn't mean that. Oh, you've been hinting around in such a thing for some time, but from now on put all such ideas right out of your head. Stop talking that way. That's not what I meant at all. I should hope not. I should hope not. Horace Vandergelder, you go your way and I'll go mine. I'm not some Irene Malloy whose head can be turned by a pot of geraniums. The idea of you even suggesting such a thing. Mrs. Levi, you misunderstood me. I certainly hope I did. If I had any intention of marrying again, it would be to a far more pleasure-loving man than you. Why, I'd marry Cornelius Hackle before I'd marry you. However, we won't discuss it anymore. Oh, here comes Augusta with our food. I'll serve it, Augusta. Yes, ma'am. Here's some white meat for you. And some peas. They're very good for you. No, Horace, as I said before, you go your way and I'll go mine. Start right in on the wine. I think you'll feel better at once. However, since you brought the matter up, that's one more thing I think I ought to say. I didn't bring the matter up at all! Well, I've forgotten all about it in just a moment, but sit down. Sit down. We'll close the matter forever in just a moment, but there's one more thing I ought to say. You're right. I'm a woman who likes to know everything that's going on, who likes to manage things. But I wouldn't like to manage anything as disorderly as your household, as out of control, as untidy. You'll have to do that yourself, God helping you. It's not out of control. Very well. Take some more peas. No horse, a complaining, quarrelsome, friendless soul like you is no sort of companion for me. You go your way, and I'll go mine. Stop saying that. I won't say another word. Besides, I'm not those things you said I am. What? Well, I guess you're friendless, aren't you? Ermengarde even told me this morning that you'd quarreled with your barber, a man who has held a razor to your throat for 20 years. Seems to me that's sinking pretty low. Well, but my, my clerks, they... Oh, they like you? Cornelius Hackle and that Barnaby? Behind your back they call you Wolf Trap. They don't! No, of course. It seems as though I'm the last person in the world that liked you. And even I'm just so-so. No, for the rest of my life I intend to have a good time. You'll be able to find some housekeeper who can make you three meals for a dollar a day. It can be done if you like cold baked beans. You'll spend your last days listening at keyholes for fear someone's cheating you. It takes more of that. Dolly, you're a damn exasperating woman. Uh, there, you see? That's the difference between us. Oh, I could be nagging you all day to put some spirit into you. You could be a perfectly charming, witty, amiable man if you wanted to. I don't want to be charming. Uh, but you are. Look at you now. You can't hide it. <coughs> Listening at keyholes. Dolly, you have no right to say such things to me. Oh, at your age, you ought to enjoy hearing the honest truth. My age! My age! You're always talking about my age. I don't know what your age is, but I do know that up in Yonkers, with bad food and a bad temper, you'll double it in six months. <laughs> Let's talk of something else. Oh, but before we leave the subject, there's one more thing I am going to say. Don't! Sometimes, just sometimes, I think I'd be tempted to marry you out of sheer pity. And if the confusion in your house gets any worse, well, I may have to. I haven't asked you to marry me. 
Well, please don't. <laughs> My house is not in confusion. What, with your niece upstairs in the restaurant right now? I fixed that better than you know. Oh, and your clerks skipping around New York behind your back? They're in Yonkers where they always are. Nonsense. What do you mean, nonsense? Cornelius Hackle is on the other side of that screen at this very minute. It ain't the same man. All right. Go on. Push it. Knock it down. Go and see. If your affairs went from bad to worse and you, became, and you became actually miserable, I might feel as if it were my duty to come up to Yonkers and be of some assistance to you. After all, I was your wife's oldest friend. I don't know how you ever got any such notion. Now, understand once and for all, I have no intention of marrying anybody. Now, I'm tired and I don't want to talk. I won't say another word either. Irene, I think you better go. You take this money and pay the bill. Oh, don't worry, it's not mine. Uh, no, 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 no. I'll tell you what we'll do. You two put on our coats and veils, and if he comes stamping over here, he'll think you're girls. What? Those things? Yes, come on. I've got a headache. I've had a bad day. Now, I'm going to Floor Van Heusen's, and then I'm going back to my hotel. So here's the money to pay for the dinner. Here's the money for the... Here's the money. I've lost my purse! Impossible. I can't imagine you without your purse. It's been stolen! Or I left it in the cab. What am I going to do? I'm new at the hotel. They don't know me. I've never been here before. Stop eating the chicken. I can't pay for it. Of course, I'll be able to find some money. Sit down and calm yourself. Dolly Gallagher, I gave you $25 this morning. I have a dissent. I gave it to my lawyer. We can borrow it from Ambrose Kemper upstairs. I wouldn't take it. Cornelius Hackle will lend it to us. He's in Yonkers. Waitress. Cornelius. Is that Mr. Vandergilder's purse? I didn't know myself. I thought it was money just wandering around loose. I didn't want anybody. Goodness, that's what politicians think. <laughs> Waitress! Irene, doesn't Barnaby make a lonely girl? He just ought to stay that way. Why should we have our evening spoiled? Cornelius, I can teach you to dance. It'll only take a few minutes, so he won't notice you. Barnaby, it's the easiest thing in the world. Of course, you danced with me at your wedding, and you danced with me at mine. Do you remember? No. Yes. Of course, you were a good dancer then. Don't confess to me that you're too old to dance. I'm not too old. I just don't want to dance. Listen to that music. Oh, Horace, do you remember the dances at the firehouse up in Yonkers on Saturday nights? Oh, you gave me a fan. Come on.
I could swear I heard a cab driver at the door. You imagine this. Imagination. Everything in life, like that disappointment, illusion. Our plans are hope. What becomes of them? Not the story of my life. Pray God nothing's happened to your girl. Is it a long journey from Yonkers? No, but long enough for a thousand things to happen. Well, we've been waiting all day. Don't you think we ought to call the police about it? The police? If it's God's will, the police can't prevent it. Oh, in three days, in a week, in a year, we'll know what's happened. And if anything terrible really has happened to Urban God, it'll be a lesson to him. That's what it'll be. To who? To that cruel uncle of hers, of course. To Horace Vandergilder and to everyone else who tries to separate young lovers. Young lovers have enough to contend with as it is. Who should know that better than I? No one. Sorry, am I not? There! Now I hear a cat quick! No, no, ma'am, I don't see anything. There! What did I tell you? Everything's disappointment, illusion. But surely, if they change their plans, Mr. Vandergrove will send you a message. Oh, I know what's the matter. That poor child probably thought she was coming to another prison, to another tyrant. If she would have known that I was her friend, and a friend of all young lovers, she'd be here by now. Oh, yes, she would. Her life shall not be crossed with obstacles and disappointments as... Cook, a minute ago my smelling salts were on the table. Now they've completely disappeared. Why, there they are, ma'am, right there in your hand. Goodness! <laughs> How did they get there? I won't inquire. Stranger things have happened. Suppose Mr. Vandergelder was sending her down with someone. Who could go astray as easy? God bless you. Now here's the carriage stopping. Well, open the door. Oh. Probably some step. And these men bars the house and force us to come inside. There's been a mistake. Is your name Miss Van Heusen? Everybody keeps asking me if my name's Miss Van Heusen. I think that's a matter I can decide for myself. <laughs> now will you all be quiet while I read this letter? I've got mine! <laughs> <laughs> God and that rascal Ambrose Temple. Ooh, now I know who you two are. <laughs> anyway, they are trying to run away. Story of my life. <laughs> Keep them in your house till I come. Mr. Temple, you have nothing to fear. Who are you? I'm Joe. I stay here till the old man comes. He owes me $15. That's right, ma'am. And we have to stay here and see if they don't escape. My dear child, take off your things. We'll all go after <laughs> coffee. You two go wait out in the hall. I'll send coffee 
out to you too. Cook? Take them. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, we're not the people you're expecting. And there's no Mr. reason. Mr. Pepper, I'm not the tyrant you think I am. No, no, you don't have to be afraid of me. I know you're trying to run away with this innocent girl. All my life, I've suffered from the interference of others. You shall not suffer the way I did. So put yourself entirely in my hands. <coughs> oh, thank God. What? What? Where's your luggage? It's, uh, uh, it's... I'll, I'll find it in the morning. It's been mislaid. Mislaid? How like life? Well, Evan God, you shall put up some of my clothes. Oh, I know I wouldn't be happy. Really? Oh, she's a shy little thing, isn't she? Timid little darling. Cook, go and put some gingerbread in the oven and get the coffee ready. Yes. Ma'am. Well, I go and run a good hot bath for Urban God. Oh, uh, uh, Miss Vance, you said. Ah, believe me, Urban God, your troubles are at an end. You two shall be married tomorrow. <laughs> My dear, you look just like I did at your age. And your sufferings have been as mine. While you're fainting, I'm coming and telling the story of my life. Oh, I don't want to take a bath. I always catch cold. No, dear, you won't catch cold. I'll slap you all over. I'll be back in a minute. Pardon me. You think we could jump down from this window? Yes, we kill ourselves. Well, we'll have to stay here and watch something happen. Pardon me. The situation's desperate. It began getting desperate about half past four, and it's been getting worse ever since. Now, I have to take a bath and get slapped all over. Oh, thank God. You've still got some sweat things off. Your bath's nearly ready. Mr. Kemper, come into the kitchen and put your feet in the oven. What's that? Oh, it's the doorbell. I expect it's your uncle. There's the doorbell. It's another man and a girl in a cab. Well, go and let them in, Cook. Now come with me, you. Oh, come, Ermin God. What? No, it's the kitchen. No, that's impossible. Come in anyway. There's some mistake. I'll tell Miss Van Heusen, but there has to be some mistake. But I tell you, I am Mr. Van Der Gelder's niece. I'm Ermin Guard. Beg your pardon, Miss B. You can't be Mr. Magard. But, but I am then. Here's my baggage. I'll tell Miss Van Houston she won't like it. You'll be all right now, Armand Guard. I better go before she sees me. Oh no, you must stay. I feel so strange here. I know, but Mr. Vandergelder will be here in a minute. Okay, Rose, you can't leave me in this crazy house with you. Drunken men in the hall. Ambrose. Ambrose. Let's say you're... Someone else that my uncle sent to take care of me. Let's say your your Cornelius Hackle. The, who's Cornelius Hackle? You know, he's chief clerk in Uncle Store. I don't want to be Cornelius Hackle. No, no. Ermengard, come away with me. I'll take you to my friend's house. Or I'll take you to Mrs. Levi's house. Why, it was Mrs. Levi who let us pray to Uncle Horace's face. Oh, I wish we were back in Yonkers where nothing ever happened. What's all this idea? Who do you say you are? Aunt yeah, Flora, don't you remember me? I'm Ermengarde. And you're Mr. Vandergilder's niece? Yes, I am. Well, that's very strange indeed. Because he has just sent me with another niece named Ermengarde. She came in with a letter from him, explaining everything. Have you got a letter from him? No. Really? And who is this? This is Cornelius Hackle in Flora. Never heard of him. He's chief clerk in Uncle Stork. Never heard of him. The other urban guard came in with the man she's in love with. And that proves it. She came in with Mr. Ambrose Kemper. Ambrose Kemper! Yes, Mr. Hackle! And Mr. Ambrose Kemper is in the kitchen now with his big 
I am. I could see. <laughs> and are people trying to separate you? Yes, they are. I could see. <laughs> Horace ran the hill, though.
about that as a handshake. I never want to see you again. Miss Van Heusen. Yes, dear? Can I have some, do I have some coffee? Yes, dear. Can I have some? Oh, come along, everybody. We'll all go into the kitchen and have some coffee. Horace, you'll be interested to know that there are two almond guards in there. Two? I'm going to get married again. Ephraim, I'm marrying Horace Vandergelder for his money. I'm going to send his money out doing all the things he taught me. Oh, it won't be a marriage in the sense that we had one, but I shall certainly make him happy. And Ephraim, I'm tired. I'm tired of living from hand to mouth, and I'm asking your permission. Ephraim, will you give me away? <coughs> Money! Money! It's like the sun we walk under. It can kill or cure. <laughs> Mr. Vandergelder's money. Vandergelder's never tired of saying most of the people in the world are fools, and in a way, he's right. Isn't he? <laughs> Himself. Irene. Cornelius. <laughs> Myself. But there comes a moment in everybody's life when he must decide whether he'll live among human beings or not. A fool among fools or a fool alone. As for me, I decided to live among them. I wasn't always so. After my husband's death, I retired into myself. Yes, in the evenings, I'd put out the cat, and I'd lock the door, and make myself a little rum toddy. And before I went off to bed, I'd say a little prayer, thanking God that I was independent, that no one else's life was mixed up with mine. And when 10 o'clock sounded from Trinity Church Tower, I fell off to sleep, and I was a perfectly contented woman. <coughs> and then, one night, after about two years of this, an oak leaf fell out of my Bible. I had placed it there on the day my husband had asked me to marry him. A perfectly good oak leaf, but without color and without life. And suddenly I realized that for a long time I had not shed one tear, nor had I been filled with the wonderful hope that something or other would turn out well. I saw that I was like that oak leaf, and on that night I decided to rejoin the human race. Yes, we're all fools, and we're all in danger of destroying the world with our folly, but the surest way to keep us out of harm is to give us the four or five human pleasures that are our right in the world. And that takes a little money. <laughs> the difference between a little money and no money at all is enormous, and can shatter the world. And the difference between a little amount of money and an enormous amount of money is very slight, and that too can shatter the world. Money, I've always felt. Money... Pardon my expression, it's like manure. It's not worth a thing unless it's spread about, encouraging young things to grow. Anyway, that's the opinion of the second Mrs. Vandergelder. Miss Van Heusen asked me to bring you this. Thank you both. Sit down and rest yourself. What's been going on in the kitchen? A lot of foolishness. Everybody's falling in love with everybody. I forgave him, Ermengarde, and that artist. I knew you would. I made Cornelius half of my partner. You won't regret it. Dolly, you said some mighty unpleasant things to me in the restaurants tonight, all about my house. And everything. Let's not say another word about it. Dolly, you've got a lot of faults. Oh, I know what you mean. You're bossy, scheming, inquisitive. Go on. <laughs> but you're a wonderful woman. Dolly, marry me. Horace, stop right there. I know I've been a fool about Mrs. Malloy and that other woman, but Dolly, forgive me and marry me. Oh, Horace, I don't dare. Oh, no, I don't dare. What do you mean? 
Well, you know as well as I do that you're the first citizen of Yonkers. Naturally, you'd expect your wife to keep open house, have scores of friends in and out all the time. Any wife of yours should be used to that kind of thing. Dolly, you can live any way you like. Horace, you can't deny it. Any wife of yours would have to be a somebody. Answer me, am I a somebody? You are, you are. Wonderful woman. Oh, you're partial. <clears throat> No, Horace, it won't be enough to load your wife with money and jewels to insist that she'd be a benefactress to half the town. <coughs> no, she must be a somebody. Do you really think I have it in me to be a credit to you? Darling, everybody knows you could do anything you wanted to do. I'll try. With your help, I'll try. Oh, and by the way, I found your purse. Where did you? A wonderful woman! <laughs> it just walked into my hands, really. I don't know how I do it. Sometimes I frighten even myself. <laughs> Horace, take it. Money walks out of my hands, too. Keep it. Keep it. Why, Horace, I never thought I'd ever hear you say a thing like that. Oh, excuse me, I didn't know anybody was here. I didn't know anybody was here! Idiot! Uh, come in, Barnaby, come in. Come in, Barnaby, <laughs> come in. Cornelius is going to marry Miss Malloy. Oh, isn't that fine? Horace? No. Uh -huh. Barnaby? Go in and tell the rest of them that Mrs. Levi is consented. Oh, finally consented. <laughs> finally consented to become my wife. Holy the voices! Hey, listen, everybody, won't you? I mean, Mr. Vandegelder is going to marry Mrs. Levi. Something's wrong with you is when you sit quietly at home, wishing you out, having lots of adventure. So that now, we all want to thank you for coming today. And we all hope that in your lives, you have just the right amount of sitting quietly at home and just the right amount of adventure. Goodbye.